Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is alcohol. And the uh, goal and focus of this talk is to accompany uh, the environmental pathology chapter in Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. And so what I'll be providing here is a background for the pathophysiology of the effects of alcohol so that you will understand this as you see this again and again as you work your way through the different organ systems. So with that in mind, I will uh, discuss the various pathways of ethanol metabolism and their associated toxic effects, as well as compare and contrast the pathologic consequences of acute and chronic uh, ethanol excess. Let's begin by looking at the scope of the problem, uh, alcohol in America. I will be using the terms uh, alcohol and ethanol interchangeably. So about one in eight Americans meet criteria for alcohol use disorder, uh, and alcohol uh, consumption accounts for about 95,000 deaths per year, of which about 10,000 are due to alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents. Alcohol is also a carcinogen uh, and uh, is responsible for about 75,000 cases of cancer per year and about 19,000 cancer deaths uh, per year. Uh, and this is for a uh, drug that is legal pretty much throughout the United States. So uh, when we consume ethanol, it is absorbed uh, from the stomach and small intestines and then distributed throughout tissues and fluids. Less than 10% is excreted in breath, urine, and sweat. And the amount in the breath is proportional to the blood level, which is the physiology behind the breathalyzer test uh, when an individual is being evaluated for intoxication uh, when driving a uh, motor vehicle. Ethanol is metabolized uh, by uh, three enzymes. Alcohol dehydrogenase accounts for about 90% of ethanol metabolism, and cytochrome P450 and catalase uh, play a more minor role. Let's take a look at this in a figure from Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. Uh, what you can see here is a hepatocyte. Uh, and one of the interesting things about alcohol metabolism is that these three enzymes work in different compartments. Uh, so we have uh, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase uh, here in the cytosol, uh, which is going uh, to transform ethanol into acid aldehyde. Actually, all three of these enzymes will generate acid aldehyde, which is a toxic metabolite. Uh, in the uh, microsomes, so part of the endoplasmic reticulum, is where our cytochrome P450 uh, works. This is primarily uh, the CYP2E1 uh, isoform uh, that, again, is going to generate acetaldehyde. And then the peroxisome, uh, using uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, catalase uh, can generate uh, acetaldehyde in water. And once this acetaldehyde is uh, generated, it then moves into the mitochondria, uh, where aldehyde dehydrogenase is going to further metabolize this to the uh, non-toxic uh, substance acetic acid. So the number of variables uh, in ethanol metabolism, uh, as far as the pathophysiology, when we think about ethanol metabolism, we know that sustained use will increase rate of metabolism. And we also have to be aware that ethanol uh, use induces cytochrome P450, especially uh, this isoform, which is so involved in alcohol metabolism. And I want to take just a moment uh, to address uh, uh, this uh, sentence, ethanol induces cytochrome P450, because I found that sentence in multiple uh, references, but no one really explained how it induces cytochrome P450. So I looked a little bit more deeply with one of my colleagues at Duke, and we found that uh, at low alcohol concentrations, we get increased uh, cytochrome P450 uh, enzyme activity and increased protein stability. Uh, whereas at very high concentrations of ethanol, we're going to uh, have an effect on the production of this enzyme, so increased mRNA and protein expression. Uh, so one of the uh, issues with uh, ethanol use is that when we uh, are inducing our cytochrome P450 uh, CYP2E1 isoform, this isoform uh, is involved not just in the metabolism of alcohol, but a variety of other substrates. Uh, so drugs such as acetaminophen and cocaine, uh, anesthetics, uh, carcinogens, and industrial solvents. Uh, so if you have uh, high levels of ethanol, they can compete with these substrates which can delay their catabolism and potentiate uh, their effects. Uh, and I think uh, we most commonly uh, think about this in the context of acetaminophen. Now, there are multiple toxic effects of ethanol metabolism. Uh, there are three that I'm going to address here. So when we uh, uh, oxidize uh, ethanol, this is going to result in de decreased concentration of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and increased NADH, which is our reduced form of NAD+. 
Uh, we can also get accumulation of acetaldehyde in particular circumstances, and acetaldehyde is toxic. And we can get direct hepatocyte injury uh, through the production of reactive oxygen species and through endotoxin release from gram-negative bacteria uh, in the uh, gastrointestinal flora. So let's address the first of these. What happens when we decrease our NAD plus and increase our NADH? So we can see here, as I mentioned, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase is the primary uh, workhorse here, and we are going to be burning through quite a lot of NAD plus and generating a fair amount of NADH. We're also going to uh, consume NAD plus uh, in our mitochondria as we generate our acetic acid. Uh, now, the challenge with this is that NAD plus is necessary for hepatic fatty acid oxidation. So if we don't have NAD plus, we cannot uh, oxidize our hepatic fatty acids. This leads to steatosis. Uh, one other issue is that when we have an increase in our ratio of NADH to NAD plus, this can lead to lactic acidosis, uh, which can cause complications of its own. Let's focus first here on steatosis. Uh, this is uh, a beautiful image of a liver biopsy from an individual uh, who has been consuming uh, excess uh, ethanol. You can see here we have large uh, droplets of fat, but we also have some microvesicular change here with uh, small droplets of fat throughout these hepatocytes. Now we can also get, uh, in some circumstances, accumulation of acetaldehyde. So as I mentioned, all of these enzymes, so cytochrome P450, alcohol dehydrogenase, and catalyse are all going to generate uh, acetaldehyde. And there is an inherited deficiency of uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase uh, in particularly some East Asian populations. And as we see so commonly, when we have an enzyme that is impaired, we're going to get a backup of our upstream substrate. So what happens here is we're going to get accumulation of acid aldehyde, which as I mentioned is a toxic and reactive metabolite. This can lead to flushing, tachycardia, and hyperventilation. Now, acetaldehyde has been uh, implicated uh, in a number of uh, malignancies, and we do know that uh, studies have shown an increased risk of esophageal carcinoma in individuals who have this inherited ALDH uh, deficiency. And then finally, uh, looking at direct hepatocyte injury. So ethanol metabolism uh, by CYP2E1 uh, is uh, going to result in the production of reactive oxygen species. Uh, these reactive oxygen species, as you'll recall from the chapter on cell injury in Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology, can lead to lipid peroxidation of hepatocyte membranes, which can lead to direct hepatocyte injury. Uh, and this is covered uh, in greater detail uh, in uh, the liver chapter of Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology and in most curricula in the context of uh, pathology of the liver. In addition, we can get the release of endotoxins and lipopolysaccharides, which are lipopolysaccharides, uh, from gram-negative bacteria, bacteria in the intestinal flora. Uh, and with uh, this elaboration uh, of uh, or release of endotoxin, we're going to get our macrophages and Kupfer cells uh, releasing tumor necrosis factor and cytokines, and these can cause direct hepatocyte injury as well. So when we think about uh, alcohol injury, uh, it's convenient and useful to think about it in uh, the terms of acute alcohol injury and chronic alcohol injury. So I'm going to begin first by discussing acute alcohol injury. Uh, there are three systems we want to think about. The first is a central nervous system. So alcohol acts as a depressant uh, on subcortical structures, which will then modulate cerebral cortical activity, leading to stimulation and disordered uh, cortical, motor, and intellectual behavior. Uh, as uh, the consumption of alcohol increases, uh, we can, at a certain point, get depressed cortical neurons uh, and lower medullary centers, which include uh, the respiratory center, which can lead to respiratory depression and respiratory arrest. As I've already mentioned, in the liver we can see uh, steatosis, and the uh, acute uh, uh, effect of alcohol in the stomach can lead to acute gastritis uh, and ulceration due to this irritation. Now, when we think about chronic alcohol uh, injury, there are a variety of uh, tissues and organs to think about. Uh, and so I'm going to work through each of these, showing you some examples of some. So with uh, chronic alcohol use, uh, we will move not only from steatosis, which is reversible, uh, but with continued injury, we can uh, go on to alcohol-related hepatitis, uh, and this can progress to cirrhosis. Uh, when we have cirrhosis, this increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. 
Another uh, organ system that can be affected by chronic alcohol injury is the gastrointestinal tract. So uh, as I've already mentioned, alcohol is an irritant. It can lead to uh, gastritis and gastric ulcer. Gastritis can result in uh, significant bleeding and you can even get perforation of a gastric ulcer. Uh, and then esophageal varices we see in the context of cirrhosis because blood flow uh, will not be able to uh, progress normally through the liver. And so we'll find uh, collateral uh, ways to uh, flow. And one of the uh, areas where collaterals will develop will be in the esophagus. So we'll get dilation uh, of these esophageal veins and these can uh, tear leading to massive bleeding. Uh, so massive bleeding is one of the consequences of chronic alcohol injury. We can see a variety of neurologic uh, injuries. So uh, very uh, often associated with chronic alcohol use is uh, deficiency in multiple vitamins, uh, in particular uh, thiamine, also known as vitamin B12, which will lead to Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, uh, which you'll learn more about in your central nervous system chapter. And then we can also see cerebral atrophy, as well as in about 1% of uh, patients, we can see cerebellar degeneration, uh, as well as optic neuropathy. The cardiovascular system uh, can uh, be uh, affected by dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, hypertension, and because of injury to liver, we can get decreased high-density lipoproteins, which can lead to atherosclerosis, uh, most significantly of our coronary vessels. So let's take a break and take a look at these uh, four systems and see what we see. This is a cirrhotic liver from an individual uh, who chronically uh, used excess alcohol. Uh, these uh, nodules are about three millimeters in diameter, uh, and you can appreciate the slightly greenish uh, color of the liver. That is due to the backup of uh, bile, so this is cholestasis. And if we were to take a section of this liver and look at it um, uh, 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 microscopically, you would see here something that looks like this, where these nodules of uh, liver are going to be separated by these bands of collagen, which in this trichrome stain uh, stains blue. So you can see here very easily why this is what it looks like grossly. But an important factor to keep in mind is that uh, with uh, these changes, if uh, an individual then becomes abstinent for alcohol, you can uh, get regression of a number of these uh, effects. So this is uh, this actually the same individual's liver. And you can see that following one year of abstinence, we've lost a lot of that fibrosis and much of our liver has regenerated. Uh, this is uh, so, uh, an example of some uh, visual uh, aids of esophageal varices. So this is a technique that's not commonly done uh, in modern times. It is an angiogram uh, demonstrating these dilated uh, veins of esophageal varices. Uh, this is actually the autopsy specimen from this patient. And the reason that you see these uh, sort of isolated polypoid lesions is because uh, this individual underwent uh, ligation banding to sort of uh, to prevent uh, this blood flow. So we just have most of this has been resolved, but we have some small polypoid areas. And then microscopically, what we would see are these dilated vessels here beneath uh, the squamous mucosa. And you can see why with this amount of blood here, and with this uh, sort of protrusion, where a tear here can lead uh, to rapid uh, exsanguination. Uh, regarding cerebellar degeneration, which as I mentioned, we can see in about 1% of patients, uh, individuals uh, can present with truncal ataxia, unsteady gait, and nystagmus. Uh, and this is uh, just a really uh, beautiful example uh, showing the cerebellar vermis. Uh, and it's easy to appreciate here the de degeneration in the folia. You can see this abundant space uh, around the folia and compare that to what we see here, uh, which is a more uh, typical appearance. And then finally, of the organ systems we just discussed, uh, here we can see our dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, as you would imagine, uh, this uh, toxic insult to the heart is going to uh, result in, uh, real, uh, in cardiac failure uh, due to the uh, inability for the heart uh, to pump uh, efficiently. Uh, the additional areas I'd like to discuss when we think about chronic uh, alcohol injury are acute and chronic pancreatitis, uh, which we can see uh, very closely associated with chronic alcohol injury. So acute uh, pancreatitis uh, can, is primarily due either uh, to uh, gallstone uh, impaction or uh, chronic alcohol use. And then the number one cause of chronic pancreatitis will be chronic alcohol use. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. 
uh, when there is maternal uh, use uh, of ethanol during pregnancy, particularly in the first trimester, we can see a variety uh, of effects. Uh, some of these are referred to as fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, the newborn uh, infant will manifest with microcephaly, uh, growth retardation, and facial abnormalities. And as the child ages, uh, decreased mental function as well as behavioral uh, changes uh, will become apparent. Uh, as I've already uh, mentioned, uh, alcohol is a carcinogen uh, and causes an increased risk of cancers of the oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, and esophagus. It's thought here, this is um, particularly the esophagus, is due to acetaldehyde production. Uh, we already alluded to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, that's due to uh, cirrhosis, and we can also see a modest uh, increase in the risk of breast cancer. Uh, and then uh, while alcohol does have calories, uh, they are frequently consumed at the expense of food, which can lead to malnutrition and vitamin de deficiencies, particularly our B vitamins. Uh, I want to focus on these two uh, before we finish up. Uh, so this is showing uh, acute uh, pancreatitis characterized by uh, some hemorrhage here, area of fat necrosis that you can appreciate here. Uh, and then here's just a histologic image where you can see uh, the pancreas as well as some uh, histologic evidence of fat necrosis. And then this is an example of chronic pancreatitis pancreatitis, where you can see that we only have minimal um, parenchyma remaining. Most of this is fibrotic uh, and is not uh, producing uh, the enzymes needed for, uh, uh, for digestion. We also have some chronic inflammation. And then uh, regarding uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, this is showing uh, the appearance of the uh, facial abnormalities seen in uh, fetal alcohol syndrome in a variety uh, of different uh, backgrounds. Uh, the characteristic findings are small eyes, a smooth philtrum, which you can appreciate here and here, uh, and a thin uh, upper lip. So as always, I'd like to uh, leave you with some questions so you can review uh, what you've learned uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, and thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you find this useful.